I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Mfumi, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And through you, my thanks to Carol Oni for holding this hearing. It is indeed important, and the fact that it's the second one does not belie the fact that we have a situation that we've not faced in 100 years. And so two hearings on this, in my opinion, is proper, if not insufficient. And I hope that we have another one next month, as I think I heard earlier today. I want to thank um, the generals here for their service to the country and for their testimony today. I want to thank Director Ray. I want to thank also all the men of the, men, the FBI, nameless and faceless that we don't know, all across the country that are doing their job at this hour. Uh, Director Ray, I was happy to hear that you have doubled the number of investigations that are underway for racially and ethically motivated hate crimes against citizens, people who get up and pay their taxes every day. And so whether it's acts against African-Americans or Latinos or Asian-Americans, as it has been recently, or gay people or immigrants, I can only tell you that doubling those efforts is appreciated. And if you want to triple them, that would be appreciated because that's too much hate in this country and too many innocent people are being affected by it. I want all of us for just a moment to remember context here. We are here today because we were all fortunate enough to get more votes than the other person. And we got elected and we became members of the House of Representatives. And we took an oath this past January. And in the oath, we said we swore to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies foreign and domestic. The domestic enemies that we saw on January 6th ought to be the sort of things that we focus on. I know I've heard a lot of talk here about Hunter Biden's laptop and uh, the border attacks and crossings and Black Lives Matter, a movement that I, by the way, support, and even heard references to COVID. This has got to do with the attempts by people to overthrow the government of the United States of America, something that hasn't happened in well over 100 years. And it's not something that we can slough off. You know, too often we hold fast to the conclusions of other people. Sometimes we subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. And quite often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. This requires thought. It requires action, it requires concentration, and we just can't slough it off and assume that it's not going to happen again. Most of you have heard the old story about Benjamin Franklin at the 1787 Constitutional Convention. When he walked outside after hours of deliberating, Miss Powell, a woman who was married to the mayor at the time, said to him, Dr. Franklin, tell us, what have you given us? Is it a monarchy or a republic? And as you know, Ben Franklin replied, ma'am, it's a republic if you can keep it. So that's what we are trying to do, keep our republic and to keep it from those who tried to overthrow this government, who wanted to kill members of Congress, who wanted to hang Mike Pence. All of you were in that gallery that day. I know I was. We saw what happened. Some of us made it back to our offices and places of lockdown. We knew at the time that this was unprecedented. And I hope we knew also that we have to find a way to make sure that it never, ever happens again. So I just want to make sure that we stay focused here. People all over the country are watching us. They know what this hearing is about. It is not about COVID-19. It is not about border crossings. It is not about Black Lives Matter. It's about a group of people who claim to be tourists and who some of you have referred to as patriots and purists when in fact they were and are indeed provocateurs, pent up with an anger and a determination to overthrow that republic. So being here is important and hearing what everybody has to say is equally as important. <laughs> you know, a Greek philosopher was once asked, when would justice ever come to Athens? And he thought about it, and he replied back thoughtfully, justice will never come to Athens until all of those who are not injured 
are just as indignant as all of those who are. This assault on our capital was an injury to millions of Americans, and we can never let it happen again. Madam Chair, I yield back any time I may have. Uh, in the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6 is uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it 
via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.